Well, welcome to our study in 1 Corinthians. And uh, we are in chapter 15. Um, the session 14, uh, and we are in chapter 15. And uh, as you know, I sometimes call this First Californians because of the peculiarity that Corinth was in its day sort of Hollywood, Las Vegas, and New York all wrapped up in one. And the term Corinth or Corinthian also came to be used for anyone that was fornicating. So to fornicate and to be a Corinthian were synonymous, strangely enough. And for that reason, I like to call First Corinthians, First Californians, because many of the things that characterize our cultural traditions from California are idiomatic, if you will, of what was going on in, in uh, Corinth. But we are in chapter 15. I've looked forward to this one especially. This is the most important chapter in the Bible and the longest in this epistle. And for that reason, let's not forget to start the way we should always start. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word. And above all, Father, we solicit your Holy Spirit to open this word to our lives that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our precious Savior, in whose name we commit this hour and ourselves. Indeed, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah, indeed. Amen. Well, it's not only the longest chapter in the Bible, it also deals with the ultimate enemy of mankind, death. We're going to hit that head on before we're through here. This chapter is regarded by many as the centerpiece of Christianity and the climax of Paul's messages. Paul would argue that this is probably the most important chapter in the Bible. Not just in the epistle, but in the Bible. Why? That's what we're going to deal with here. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to talk about the definition of the gospel. Ask a Christian what the gospel is, and you'll say, well, that's the good news. That's a cop-out answer. What is it really? And it's defined for us right here in the first few verses of chapter 15. Then we're going to get into the death and resurrection. What is that all about? And we're going to also get introduced to a topic that most churches are oblivious to. His kingdom. That's not a fuzzy, fuzzy idea. It's a kingdom that has boundaries, a king, and subjects. We want to understand what that's all about. It'll then go on. We'll talk about the physics of immortality and the resurrection body. And we will encounter one of the key references to what's called the harpazo, or more commonly called the rapture, after the Latin Bible, if you will. Now, these first three segments we will do in this session, but trying to do it all in one session would be just a little too crowded. So we're going to have a second session on this chapter. So we're going to have chapter 14 and 15 of our series uh, in, uh, uh, in, in these materials. So let's just jump in with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And uh, the gospel. That's the question here. What is the gospel? If I gave you a written exam to write it out, what would you say? Paul will give us the gospel in a nutshell. And uh, we need to understand, as Christians, we need to understand precisely what the gospel is, because we'll discover astonishingly that that is hard to find coming from a pulpit today. They'll talk about a lot of interesting things, but the gospel is astonishingly absent. Why? What's going on here? See, Paul had already preached it back in Acts 13. And after his Damascus conversion, Peter and James uh, spent time with Paul in Jerusalem to fill in the details. That's all in Galatians uh, uh, 1. And after 14 years passed, he returned to Jerusalem to, confirm with, the, to uh, confirm with the apostles whether his preaching was in harmony with the gospel that they proclaimed. So there was a harmonization going on. This wasn't unique to Paul. They had compared notes and they all had agreed. So what is the gospel? He's going to define it for us here. Paul says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That's rather, by which also ye are saved. 
That is, that's in the present continuous sense. You are being saved. You've been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. What does that mean? We'll talk about it. There are three. It'll be clearer, I think, if you think of salvation as having three tenses. And uh, the past tense is something that was completed on a cross 2,000 years ago on a cross in Judea. It is it, once, it's, it, this is in the aorist tense, it's once and for all. It's spiritually linked to Jesus. The shepherd keeps the sheep. But then it's also being saved in the present tense, growing as an instrument of his grace. We need to apply our salvation to our lives, is the idea. And you may be saved, but what have you done with it, is the question that it begs. And uh, it is possible, apparently, to believe in vain. That's a shocker, isn't it? And uh, it's not just insurance policy against going to hell. And the future tense of salvation is the resurrection or the glorification. Now, many scholars will, we, we, in the KI, we try not to use the word salvation. We use one of three phrases. The past tense we call justification. That occurred. It's a done deal. It occurred by Jesus on a cross 2,000 years ago. The present tense we call sanctification. That's We all, every one of us, are a work in progress. So that's the present tense, if you will, of salvation. And then the future tense, we will be saved when we get our resurrection bodies, and we'll be talking about that before this chapter is finished. Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures. That's the first element of key. There are three key elements here. The first is that Christ didn't disappear. He died, and He didn't just die. He died for our sins. And uh, the authorities, both Jewish and Roman, made sure that His death was undeniable. It's the best documented death on the planet Earth. And the authorities outwitted themselves when they took so many precautions to make sure that Jesus was dead and remained in the grave to the best of their ability. That's what they tried to do. And he died. He didn't, and he didn't just die. He fulfilled a number of specifications. See, the idea of promoting that the body was stolen was an admission that the sepulcher was indeed vacant, by the way. We'll get to that. Okay? And so, notice though, he didn't just die. He, he did it according to uh, dozens of specific specifications that had been laid down hundreds of years earlier. I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He uses that phrase several times here. Three t twice in three verses, he uses that phrase, according to the Scriptures. Jesus' death and resurrection was not an afterthought. In fact, it really wasn't a tragedy, it was an achievement. It was an achievement planned before the foundation of the world. And, uh, this was and, and, uh, and now it's hidden, and it's even hidden, by the way, in the genealogy of Noah itself. For those of you, you can check our materials out on this whole development of, uh, from Genesis chapter 5. But the definition of the gospel, one, that he died for our sins, and uh, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. And, uh, and then he appeared to others. He, so we get to verse 3. We're making our progress through this chapter. Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And uh, that's, this is the first of three elements here. It's first in importance, not in chronology. And uh, that Christ died. And that's a title. That's not his name. That's a title. Paul uses his official title of the Messiah, our Goel, our kinsman redeemer, and, uh, or Messiah. Uh, Mashiach would be the Hebrew term. And uh, uh, died for us according to the scriptures. That may be a surprise to you to realize how many places in the Old Testament it mentions. Isaiah 53 comes to mind, of course. Psalm 22, of course. And there's other allusions to, uh, to the Old Testament references here. And uh, he died for our sins. And uh, that also specifically was the purpose. Now, the phrase that Christ died for sins is the doctrinal summary of what we call the atonement. In several ways, he was our substitute. Christ died to appease God and to meet the demands of the law. He is our advocate. He effected re reconciliation and made us righteous before God. He is our mediator. He established the new covenant and accepts us as partners and maintains that relationship, by the way. And uh, he's our savior. He grants us eternal life through, the, through faith in him. 
So there are at least four ways that he, uh, of the atonement. Substitute, advocate, mediator, and savior. And then it continues, and he was buried. Only Paul makes that emphasis. He was buried, and then he rose again. According to the, uh, uh, the idea that he's buried, by the way, is uh, points backward to the reality of death, yet forward to the character of the resurrection, which we're going to be dealing in this chapter. And uh, Paul identifies the believer's baptism with Christ's burial. His burial and our baptism are uh, theologically linked. And, uh, and then that he rose again on the third day, the resurrection itself. And now the translations fail to exploit differences in the Greek verb tenses between verses 3 and 4. The Greek uses the past tense to describe a single action in the past for Jesus' death and burial. But for the verb to be raised in the Greek, it's in the perfect tense to indicate an action that occurred in the past but has lasting relevance to the present. It's an unusual structure. In the Greek, that's very, that leaps out at you. In the English, it doesn't. And uh, so, Jesus was raised from the dead and continues his life in the resurrected state to this day. The, the, when you first start studying the Bible, one of the shocking things you discover is that, that, uh, God, that um, uh, God became man. But then as you mature in your understanding of the thing, the thing that really surprises you, as you begin to understand the gulf between sinful man and a holy God, the really astonishing discovery is that as, as we sit here today, there is a man on the throne of God. And that's staggering when you really absorb what that is. See, Jesus didn't become a man for three and a half years while he had his ministry or whatever. In other words, this he is a man still to this day. He is both. Fully divine, yes, but fully human also, even today. And that's a, that's a, a shocker, and that's emphasized in Revelation 5 and elsewhere. Now, the passive voice in the structure here denotes that the implied agent is God himself. And uh, if the Roman or Jewish authorities could have produced the body, all the rumors would have been quickly stopped and all uh, this all would have ended. But they could not. The Jewish and Roman authorities exhausted themselves trying to account for the body. The empty tomb emphasized, emphasized that Jesus' resurrection was physical. It wasn't some kind of fuzzy thing. That's emphasized in all four Gospels that the body was missing. And we'll get more to that before we're through here. So we get to verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now that third day is an interesting thing. Because he's talking about the Old Testament, the scriptures. Where in the Old Testament does the Old Testament proclaim that he will be in the tomb three days? Now the first place you think, well, sure, the study of Jonah, remember? And uh, we all, we all uh, deal with that that Jesus taught that he would be killed and raised the third day. Now, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 is linked with Matthew 12 40. So everybody usually thinks of Matthew 12 40 right away because Jesus himself indicates that as Jonah was three days, so he, he links that up for us. So that one's easy. But it may shock you to know that there's many places in the Old Testament where the three day is alluded to, in some cases quite cryptically, but still they're there. And so I've got a few references in there that you can check out. Psalm 16, uh, 8 to 11. Psalm 110, verse 1. And some would point to Hosea, the first few verses of Hosea 6. The most dramatic example probably is Genesis 22, known as the Akedah, Abram's offering of Isaac. Because we learn from Hebrews 11:19 that Isaac was dead to Abraham for three days. And you have to understand the Jewish mind. When the commandment came, as far as Abraham, he was dead to Abraham. And that sounds contrived, except Hebrews 11, 19 underscores that, per, that under, per, perception. There are other examples for three days. The third day of creation. Um, the double blessing on the third day. The Akedah I just mentioned. Uh, Joseph interprets two dreams in Genesis 40. The baker and the um, cupbearer uh, to the king. And the, the, they speak of the bread and wine. The bread and wine don't start there. It actually starts back in Genesis 14 by the administration of Melchizedek. And that's a special study you should undertake on your own. 
But clearly the bread and wine start back there. And the, the baker and the cupbearer have a dream that Joseph interprets. In the one case he dies, in the other case he's freed. But there again we have, with 2020 hindsight, we realize that's, being, that's anticipating the three days in the tomb. The crossing of the Red Sea, departing from Mount Sinai. When the spies are en route from Jericho, in jo Joshua chapter 2, you won't catch that unless you look at the Hebrew. Because Rahab the harlot uses the term, when she speaks of the line, the, he the hebel. And uh, the spies say, that's okay, when, when uh, you get here, to get your family here, we take that line and put it out and we'll, the, our people will protect your family then. But they use a different term when they speak of the line. They use the word tikva. Rahab uses the term hebel. They both word, hebel and ke both can mean a line or a cord. But uh, they also mean something else. A hebel is pain, suffering. It's a term uh, for that. Tikva is, uh, is ho means hope. The national anthem of Israel is ha tikva, the hope. And uh, what's interesting is that between those two verses, Rahab says, you hide in the mountains for three days. Not, why not four or five? No, three days. And we discover there are three days between the hebel of Golgotha and the tikva of the empty tomb. And you say, Chuck, you're, con you're contriving something. No, take a look at it, come to your own conclusions. Of course, Jonah, the big fish, Jesus himself authenticates. Esther, she fasts for three days. The wedding in Cana was on the third day. It's all, Jewish weddings are usually on a Tuesday. And Christ was three days, in, of course, in the tomb. And uh, Saul's blindness in Damascus was a three-day affair. And Hosea's petition for the Lord's return has a three-day element to it. So those are just some examples. There's probably others. I invite you to search for them. So after his resurrection... Jesus' physical body has some interesting properties. This is after the resurrection, we discover. Jesus' body could be touched. Remember there? He says, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. He could be recognized, but with difficulty. And we have a whole study on that that I invite you to take a look at from John 20. But even though he's physical, he said, handle me. and They thought he was a, 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 a phantom or something. He says, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. And yet, he could walk through walls. He had an ability. He, he was transcendent from the physical reality that we take for granted. And there's more to that. He could eat and drink with them. It's very interesting how he, after his resurrection, we never find him where he's not eating. He's my kind of guy. <laughs> and uh, Jesus' resurrection body was transformed to, to transcend both time and space. And that's flabbergasting. And uh, then he continues, and he was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, then of the twelve. And uh, it, uh, it's interesting that um, in the Jewish style, he does not list the appearances to the women. Because within the Jewish culture, women testimony was not admissible in court. So it's interesting he focuses on the men, which is a shame because the women recognized it earlier. They were on their toes here, but they weren't eligible as witnesses before Jewish law. And uh, on that Sunday, Jesus appeared to the women, Mary Magdalene, two men on the road to Emmaus, Peter, and the ten disciples in the upper room, we find in Luke 24. And, uh, and Cephas, he appeared, he first mentions Peter, whom he usually calls Cephas, the, that's the Aramaic name for Peter, if you will. And uh, so... Sunday evening, the disciples in the upper room told the men from Emmaus that he appeared to Simon. And that morning, the angel instructed the women to tell the disciples, um, and Pe he says, tell the disciples, the angel says, tell the disciples and Peter. See, Peter had sort of disqualified himself when you deny him, denied him three times. When they later meet up in the Galilee, Jesus gives him three occasions to reinstate himself. He reinstates him, if you will. And uh, so, it's, uh, we go, and that's all in John 21, very famous situation there. The book of Acts reveals the, uh, that immediately after the ascension, Peter became the undisputed leader in the Jerusalem church. So here's a guy that denied Christ on the one hand, Christ reinstates him, and he emerges as the primary leader uh, subsequently. Interesting. And so... Then of the twelve, the twelve is a title, sort of, 
And Paul lists the twelve, the common collective term for the disciples. Now let me ask you a question. If I told you that JFK, the President of the United States, was killed with a bow and arrow, would you believe me? Could I possibly fly that as an explanation? Why could I never get away with that? If I was trying to tell you that JFK, when he was assassinated, he was assassinated with a bow and arrow, who, who would believe me? Obviously, no one. Why? Because there were too many eyewitnesses. I couldn't fly that as a story because there's too many people around that you know that saw it happen. You with me? You getting it? That's exactly the situation we're facing here. When Paul was writing this letter to the Corinthian church, there were many of the 500, among them, not all of them, but many of them, too many for anyone to fly an alternative story because there are too many eyewitnesses. There are witnesses still alive who know better. In the, in the first century, that was true of the resurrected Christ. There were lots of people around that knew better. So it goes on in verse 6 here. After that, he, he, Jesus, was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Now we don't know exactly when that was, but anyway. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. In other words, some had passed away. But a large number of them were still alive there. Over 500. And we can't find a specific which 500, and what is he alluding to? He's alluding to something they all knew. We don't have an explicit specific example from the, from the uh, uh, Gospels. Some associated several different ways. But uh, yeah. a crowd would not be surprising because Jesus announced this appearance through the women earlier. They remain unto this present time. In the Jewish court, by the way, the presence of two or three witnesses was mandatory to prove a veracity of any event. And there's, of course, more than two to three here. Most of the 500 were still living. And when Paul wrote this epistle, it was about 25 years after the fact. So there's still, a, a, some had passed, but most of them were still alive, apparently. And so, and apparently Paul and the Corinthians were acquainted with many of them. So that's, the, that's a factor you can't escape. It's live and real. So after that, he was seen of James and then all of the apostles. Now, half a year before Jesus' death, his brothers, including James, still did not believe him. We find out that from John 7. And uh, so, uh, and immediately after Jesus' uh, ascension, his brothers believed and were with the apostles in the upper room. It's very, very interesting that there were three Jameses in the Bible, two of them were at the cross, one was not. But the one that was not ends up becoming a believer and ends up being one of the major leaders in the church in Jerusalem later. So you want to dig into the, do your study on the diff different Jameses. Um, James listened to Paul when the former prosecutor returned to Jerusalem as a believer. James filled Peter's place when the apostle fled Jerusalem after his release from prison in Acts 12. And after his third missionary tour, Paul reported to James and the elders in Jerusalem. James, by then, was the elder in Jerusalem. So he becomes a... The, uh, 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 and I love his nickname, by the way. James's nickname was called Old Camel Knees. <laughs> because he spent so much time praying. Okay. And all of the apostles. Now, the apostles... The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that word um, signifies the twelve. Now, by contrast that, in the book of Acts, Luke uses the term to include Paul and Barnabas in the twelve, but they really weren't part of the original twelve. Uh, Antichus and uh, Junius, uh, according to Paul, were outstanding among the apostles, according to Romans 16. But in this context here, we assume it refers to the twelve exclusive of... Uh, obviously Judas, and apparently with Matthias taking his place, if you will. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Last of all, you know, Paul always places himself um, last, because of the Damascus Road coming so late, prior to which he persecuted the church, and he never forgave himself for that. <laughs> 
If any had a basis before God, Paul certainly did. But he saw on the Damascus Road what a wretched, arrogant, independent, selfish creature he really was. And he never lets go of that. He's very candid about that all the way through. He didn't have any exaggerated view of his own importance. And he, sends, he, he serves as an ex incredible example for all of us. And uh, we need to come to the same place Paul did. Unless there is in your own life a true recognition of sin, self in all its ugliness, you're not saved. If you're really saved, that will be part of the dynamic that's going on. You can speak of salvation only as the blind speak of color. Think about that for a minute. If you don't have a true recognition of sin in all its ugliness, you can speak of salvation only as the blind speak of color. You may know a lot about it, but that's quite a different thing than experiencing it. Born out of due time, he says. Ectromatai. Before the due time. Paul thinks of himself here as an Israelite whose time to be born again had not come nationally. He's drawing a, a, a parallel here. His conversion by the appearing of the Lord in glory was an illustration before the time of the future national conversion of Israel. He draws a parallel of that. It's an eschatological term, actually. And, uh, but he also acknowledges that he was appointed from his mother's womb to be an apostle. And that's why he's so grievous over that period of his life where he was an enemy of the cross. Jesus stepped down from the throne to the cross, devoid of guilt of sin, and then attacked death itself. As Peter said on the day of Pentecost, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In his innocence, that's true, but he took our sin. That changed everything. As by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's obedience, many were made righteous. That's Romans' expression in Romans 5. This doesn't happen gradually by growth over the years go by. It results from a crisis at a certain point in your life. There's a certain point in your life where that becomes the crisis. And the question that we should just ask ourselves, and you put it in your notes, have you picked up your passport to eternal life? It's an event. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. That's Paul's confession. I am the least of the apostles, he says. Even Paul's initial acceptance was junior to them. After 14 years, he returned to Jerusalem to confirm the harmony of the gospel with them, to make sure that what he was teaching was in step, that they're all marching together, and they were. The apostles recognized Paul's special ministry and later placed him on an equal footing with them. And Galatians 2 deals with that. Galatians chapter 2 deals with all of that. He, but he always, always presents himself as the least among the apostles. Ephesians 3, 1 Timothy, elsewhere. He continually reminded himself that he persecuted the church of God. The ecclesia of God. Continuing verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Wow, there we are. By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace was not in vain. Grace is used three times in this verse. Three times. And uh, notice what he accomplished in only two decades. He toiled as a tent maker in Ephesus in Acts 20. He was an instructor in the rented hall of uh, Tyrannus. And he preached house to house in Acts 20. And, and, and what he accomplished was in all within two decades. Therefore, he says, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he rose from the dead, how say among some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He, he, he's, he's, you're going to start attacking this. There's a skepticism growing that 
You can be resurrected from the dead. Well, wait a minute. What about Christ? Is, is what are you going to get here? He rose from the dead. To raise is here in the perfect tense. By conquering death, Jesus Christ never has to face death again. And uh, Philetus and Hymenaeus denied the doctrine of the bodily resurrection, destroyed the faith of some, we find in 2 Timothy 2. So Paul handed him over to Satan, we find from Paul's letter to Timothy. And uh, he rose from the dead. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? See, a gospel without the tenet of the resurrection has no message of redemption. Let that, that's really what Paul's going to drive home here. If there's no, the, 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 a gospel that doesn't preach the resurrection doesn't have a message of redemption that can be empty, then we wonder why how many pulpits in the heart of hearts the pastors don't really believe in the resurrection. They, they sweep it under the carpet. Paul highlights six history-changing facts that would have followed if Christ had not risen from the dead. Okay. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, Ooh. and your faith is also vain. Without the preaching of the resurrection, we're the most miserable of men. To deny the resurrection is to go against all pertinent evidence that was available to the early church. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that dead rise not. If you argue that at camp, and then you're, 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 you're lying here. Can you imagine Paul testifying falsely of God? I don't think so. Paul was a Pharisee. The penalty in the Old Testament for being a false prophet was death itself. Deuteronomy 18. The same thing is true in the New Testament, 1 John 5 and elsewhere. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not risen. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Oh, that's important, that's critical. That's the core issue of the whole message. And one thing that disturbs me, and it's disturbed me for more than 60 years, is that of study. And that is that it's hard to find pulpits that really preach the resurrection. It's just not modern. It's sort of a tradition. It's sort of glossed over. No, that's the core issue of what we're selling here. Step by step, Paul reveals to them the spiritual implications of denial. The justification of believers rests squarely on the resurrection of Christ. That's the key of all. There's a lot of other things we might have different views about. Not about that one. That's the core of the whole deal. Otherwise, ye are yet in your sins. That's heavy. I cannot imagine any heavier words that Paul might use. He continues, Then they which are also fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Fallen asleep is, of course, a euphemism for those who have died. And there's lots of examples that used all through the scripture as just a euphemistic term. Thus Paul can speak of death as a gain in Philippians 1.21 and 1.23. For me to die as a gain is, a, is, is an advantage. Let me add it. A denial of the resurrection would mean that all have perished, including Jesus. It makes the believer a martyr to an illusion. Are you a martyr to an illusion? That's what they'd have you believe. Death is unable to break the bond that exists between Christ and believers in the earthly life. That bond continues to their life hereafter and lasts eternally. We're linked to him eternally. After writing seven conditional statements to demonstrate the effect of denying the resurrection, Paul returns to the consistent doctrine of the Christian church, Christ's resurrection. He hasn't let go. He's going on here. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Praise God. There's that term firstfruits again. While unbelievers continue to scoff, Christians do not need further proof that the empty tomb and the appearances are as described in, the, the, in, in verses 3 to 8. The first fruits indicate that the first sheaf 
of the forthcoming gain of uh, harvest will be followed by the rest of the sheaves. Christ is the guarantee for all who belong to him that they also will share in the resurrection. You need to understand that when the empty tomb occurred, when Christ was resurrected, that was eternal verification that his uh, sacrifice was sufficient. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have been able to rise. The fact that he was able to rise validates the whole package. We need to understand how crucial that Sunday morning was when they discover the empty tomb and he turns out to be walking around teaching them on the way to Emmaus, whatever, and all that that happened following. That validated that this wasn't an empty promise. God did what he said he's going to do. The first fruits, and that term is used from Leviticus 23 on, and uh, counting, the, counting the Omer, the 49 days. Uh, you have to study the Feast of Israel to really understand that. And uh, a century later, Israel was called the first fruits in Jeremiah 2. And Paul uh, applied the term to the first converts in Western Asia and in Southern Greece. He uses that term. The 144,000 redeemed from the earth are offered as a first fruits to God in Revelation 14 and so on. And uh, the sons of the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite, the daughter of J Jairus, the young man of Nain and Lazarus, all these people died and were resurrected, but they didn't get resurrection bodies. They died again. See, Lazarus died. He was resurrected, but not like we're talking about here because he, he died again. You follow me? In fact, when Lazarus was walking around after his resurrection, they had to kill him. And they, there was a plot to do that. That's in your script. That's in the uh, Gospels. You see, they were, these are raised. The widow of Zarephath, the Shunammite, the daughter of Jairus, and the young man of Nain, and Lazarus. Those were all examples of people that were raised from the dead, but not in the sense we're talking about here, because they were still subject to death subsequently. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's why in uh, Revelation 5, the word came out, who, they, they needed a man, who is worthy to open the book, the book and loose the seals there. And no man in heaven, it had to be a man, it had to be a kinsman of Adam. And no one was found. That's why John is sobbing convulsively there in Revelation 5. Till and else says, wait, 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 wait. Look, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And then he turns and he saw the lambs that had been slain. Ooh. The, since man, by man came death, by man came also resurrection. That's typical Jewish or Semitic parallelism. The Bible, story is, the Bible is a story of two men, Adam and Christ. Christ the la is called the last Adam in that sense. And uh, the Greek has the preposition dia by to show that man is the agent responsible for death. And we, we have a genetic defect, penalty of death. We are genetic offspring from, a from Adam. And we, carry, we have a genetic defect. It's called sin. Before the fall, Adam was able to sin or not to sin. After the fall, he was not able to not to sin. Up till then he had choice. From that point on he's subject to sin. And so are we. Christ alone lived without sin and conquered death for all his people. Death having been caused by a human being can be made ineffective only by a human being. Romans 5 deals with that. Revelation 5. Both Romans 5 and, Je and Revelation 5 deal with that. That's why the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, is typified by Boaz in the book of Ruth. That's why the book of Ruth is perhaps the most interesting New Testament study in the Old Testament. And that's why they don't realize it, why they always read it at Pentecost. In the Jewish community, they always read the book of Ruth at the, at the Feast of Shavuot. Shavuot is the only of the seven feasts of Israel in which leavened bread is used. Gives it a Gentile flavor. There are only two spheres, Adam and Christ. You either in one or the other. In Adam all die. The marks of death are upon each of us today. And uh, so, and by the way, we did not even have the ability to choose without the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Factor that marvelous insight into your view of the eternal security. Sin is the decaying fruit of self-life. We need to be born a second time. We need to be rescued from the domain of Satan. We are hopeless slaves to the enemy. You had nothing to do with your first birth, but you are involved in a sin. You have nothing to do with your second birth, 
but you are involved in its deliverance and implicated in the purity of God. The pursuit of the present immorality is a denial of the resurrection. There's another goal of transhumanism you need to be aware of. There's a whole thing happening in technology today called transhumanism. And uh, the announced goal of transhumanism is to, the ultimate goal, there are, there are four technologies that are racing in, in incredible speed. Genetics, robotics, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence. Those four are racing to an area we call collectively transhumanism. The goal of transhumanism ultimately, and this is, this is described by them in great detail, is to transfer one's consciousness, and that's really a software issue, into a more functional or artificial environment. If you can transfer your consciousness into, say, a very advanced computer, you can then transfer it into another body that's more, uh, better designed than the one you have. That means you have a form of immortality. You're, you're, you're just temporarily resident in this body that you're in now. Transhumanism has as its goal to be able to transfer that consciousness. Well, that's a path. To, that's what they, um, the, the, the practitioners in that field are, are uh, uh, aspiring to. And I think Genesis 11 has the answer. God will draw a line in the sand and say, here and no further. Because he, there he declares that the, the, the thing he's trying to avoid, he says they'll be able to do anything they imagine to do. That's what led to the confusion of tongues. And I think God will find another way to draw a line in the sand. The increasingly rapid developments in genetics, robotics, and nanotechnology and artificial intelligence is leading the race in an emerging field. There is a race going on, well-funded, among the major countries trying to create the, the uh, uh, super soldier, taking those technologies and creating a warrior that is a superior kind of warrior using those technologies. And it's, it's very uh, classified, very hidden, but very aggressively funded in uh, Russia, in China, in the U.S., and uh, probably, I'm sure elsewhere. And so... The whole move, uh, transhumanism, we have materials on that for those who are interested. Let's move back to this, uh, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice that word all, I like that. All that are Christ, that is. We're not talking about universalism here. Uh, all those that are Christ's will be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And uh, first fruits and afterward. And uh, so you want to study the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Shavuot, as it's called, the Feast of First and the Feast of Shavuot, uh, sometimes called the Feast of Weeks or sometimes called Pentecost. You want to study that. And uh, first and then, see, first man in his own order, then. Notice that Christ says nothing about the resurrection of unbelievers. They have, an un they have a resurrection too, but that's at the end of the thousand years at the great white throne. And that's a whole other study I invite you to get into. The dead who die out of Christ are not left in disintegration and corruption. Unbelievers will also ultimately be resurrected, but to shame and everlasting contempt. And that's in Daniel 12, John 5, and elsewhere. By the way, do you realize you've never met a mere mortal? Everybody you met is Im is 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 uh, immo is Permanent, in one place or the other. See, software has no mass. The real you is software, not hardware. Software has no mass. So software has no time. You're eternal whether you're saved or not. The issue is where are you going to spend it? If you're perfect, you can be in the presence of God. Ooh, I'm not perfect. Of course not. Unless you're, that's been pro provided for you by imputing Christ's righteousness to you. So are you personally involved with the program of God is the question. I'll leave that with you and we'll move on. Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. Put down all rule. The word the, the abolish, uh, kartageo, making all ruling powers ineffective, terminating and setting them aside. Rule, Authority and power are also Jewish terms 
designating demons, by the way. And you can find plenty of references. They're in your notes, so you can take a look at that. Note that Jesus reigns now. He is in control now. Okay? He ha uh, what a reassurance that is. He hasn't exercised all that, but he reigns now. And so, the kingdom. What are we talking about this kingdom? Do you realize that probably one church in ten will even acknowledge the kingdom of, from heaven? Well, the kingdom of God, that's all inclusive of everything God's created. Yes, that's the kingdom of God. It's a large term. There's a subset of that called the kingdom from heaven that Matthew alone talks about. He uses that term 33 times. Not always. Five times he uses the kingdom of God like everybody else does. But 33 times Matthew talks about the kingdom from heaven. It's a subset, a specific designated subset. And you want to study that and understand that. So that's that kingdom. And most churches have no idea what I'm talking about. And then I did a book called The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy kingdom come. Most Christians have no idea what they're praying for when they pray that prayer. Matthew defines it for us, clearly. Well, he always uses that term. No, he doesn't. Five times he uses the kingdom of God, a more broader, a broader term, like Mark, Luke, and John use. So, but continue here. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That is his goal. And uh, so... He must reign till he put all enemies on his feet. That's a, that's a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1. That's the, ter that's the psalm that Jesus quoted to confuse all his uh, uh, detractors. The Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees were questioning him. He says, can I ask you a question? Sure. Says, Jesus, uh, uh, the uh, Messiah, whose son is he? Son of David. And he says, okay, how can David call him my Lord if he's the son of David? And these lawyers couldn't from that, the way Matthew 20 ends, that last verse in that, that segment, he says, none of them dared ask him another question. He left them confused because they couldn't unravel the first verse, chapter of, of uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. And the fourth one of that is the one that really nails it for Melchizedek, for those of you that are studying that. So this uh, Psalm 110 quoted in Matthew 22. I welcome you to to take a look at the close of that chapter. It's one of the funniest chapters in the Bible for, for me. And, uh, but we know that is at his ascension, angels, authorities, and powers were placed in submission to him. And in our book, I, Jesus, that Welty and I put together, the uh, I, Jesus, an autobiography, we love that. Uh, one of the 35 statements he makes is that all the angels are his personal property. Now, if somebody ran around here saying that, you'd, ha you'd lock him up as a, in a loony bin. Jesus made that declaration. But in his case, it's true. <laughs> See? So, he must reign. And uh, so, that's an imperative. It's not a suggestion, it's an imperative. His reign is a reign of conquest. Think not that I send a peace on earth, he says in Matthew 10. I send not a peace but a sword, verse 34. Wow. There can be no maverick molecules in the universe. You cannot go into glory except under the sovereignty of the one who has won the right for you to enter. And he's done all that for you and me. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's what he came to set down. Christ holds the keys of death and the grave. When Christ destroys the last enemy, death, he will already have delivered his kingdom to the Father. Ooh. If there is a resurrection of all believers, the power of death ends once and for all. Both death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. In the renewal of heaven and earth, death will be no more, Revelation 21 tells us. He continues here, for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. That was everything but himself, is what he's saying here. And uh, so Psalm 110 is here broadened to include everything. Very similar to Psalm 8. This passage has been noted by scholars as having an interesting inversion that takes place from verses 24 and 28, with parallel passages are noted. And uh, there's a chiasmic structure. You know what a chiasmic structure is? 
it's a, f a form of inversion it, it, to a center and then backs out. It's, there's a structure, it gives you an example of chiasmic structure. Uh, Bollinger's entire Bible has been structured that way if you're interested in it. But there's a number of places where that structure evidences, if nothing else, it clearly evidences design. That the Bible is specifically designed. And if you go, you study that, and I won't try to undo it here because of our own time, but you can take a look at that, uh, how, you know, how it, it works to, this, to the last enemy and then summarizes the implication of that. From A through E is, the, is what's happening, and from E through back out to A is the relevance of what is happening. That peculiar structure is called a chiasmic structure, and this is an example for two reasons. It's relevant to what we're talking about, but it's also something, another way of showing you what we mean by a chiasm, chiasmic structure. It's when, incidentally, when you do that with the Song of Songs, it's incredibly revealing of what, what the Song of Songs is really all about. Solomon's Song of Songs is perhaps the, has more variety of interpretations than any other book in the Bible. But the illuminating one is when you do this to it, by the way, and you find out what it's really all about. And I'll leave that alone and leave you to this special study you can go into. The purpose of Psalm 8 is to reveal Adam's sinlessness before the fall. The stark reality of sin undermined man's authority, according to Hebrews 2. God has put all things under Christ's feet, through whom he created the universe, we find. The verses are right there. Check, check them out. When all things are eventually subject to Christ, then he delivers the kingdom to the Father, making the end of his immediate mediatorial work, uh, interceding for them and preparing a place for them. So there's a summary of the whole mandate if you want to take a look at it. From Romans 8 and John 14 and so on. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, why? That God may be all in all. All things are subdued to him. They'll be subject to him. All things under him. The verb to subject occurs three times in three different Greek firms here. Six times in two verses. And uh, even the wind and the waves of the Sea of Galilee obeyed him. The demons submitted to him in Mark 8. Matthew 8, excuse me. And Satan himself fell from heaven in Luke 10. The Son proceeds eternally from the Father and confesses that he can do nothing of himself, only those things which he sees the Father doing, John 5. And when all things shall be sued unto him, shall the Son himself also be subject to him, put all things under him, that why? That God may be all in all. And that echoes Je Zechariah 14, Deuteronomy 6, Isaiah 43, and elsewhere. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Romans 11 hammers that. That's the th third of three chapters in Romans focusing on the, the past, present, and future of the nation Israel. People, uh, Christian churches that don't understand Israel need to read the three chapters that John has set aside to nail that problem. Whole another discussion at another time. He invites his people to sit with him as judges in all through the scriptures, Matthew 19, Luke 22, and so on. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? They shouldn't be. He's, using, he's just alluding to the, 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 the foolishness of that. Baptized for the dead. Throughout the centuries, the explanations for this verse have been numerous and varied. The teaching of Christ's apostles never included uttering prayers for the dead. It's the, the inverse of a rhetorical question. Paul states this, the fact as untrue. If Jesus Christ is not alive, why be baptized in the name of a dead Savior is what he's really saying. It's a rhetorical claim, if you will. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? If Christ is dead, why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Paul's next letter catalogs the perils and adversities he's done. When you get to 2 Corinthians, he's going to deal with this in detail. The, the perils and adversities he, he's endured. Astonishing. Boy. I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ, Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Daily I die. Paul was never out of peril his entire ministry. We should realize there's turmoil coming. A lot of Christians are really concerned. They think, well, we're going to have the rapture first. No, we're never... The rapture, the rapture may occur at any time. But Christ promised us persecution. 
per promised us persecution. We need to understand that. That's the history. That's what we bought into. And uh, so, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And he's quoting a proverb here, obviously, from Isaiah 22 and elsewhere. Paul spent three years at Ephesus during his third journey, but the only account of this interval is in Acts 19. Paul relates that God raised him from the dead, as it were. And he'll deal with that in 2 Corinthians. That Paul was left as, as of dead. And of course, that proverb is, he quotes from Isaiah 22, and, and Jesus himself even echoes that proverb in Luke 12. But it's a proverb that we obviously, it's, it's the adverse of it, if you will. Wild animals. Could Paul have been exposed to wild animals in the arena in Ephesus is the, is the uh, speculation. We know that he was delivered from the lion's mouth in 2 Timothy 4. But Roman's laws would restrict local authorities from throwing Paul, a Roman citizen, to the lions. But they often didn't realize that and got into trouble. When in prison in Caesarea, he appealed to Caesar on the basis of that citizenship. Boy, did that shake them up. They didn't realize he was, a, he was born a Roman citizen. That was a big surprise to the Roman leaders. They realized they had a problem on their hands because they were committed to protecting him, not harassing him. And uh, it was the, the animals might have been figurative. Demetrius and his associates behaved like wild beasts, we hear in Acts 19. Man, moving on. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. Now he quotes a proverb here in Theos of the Greek, the Greek poet, Meander. Menander. The, uh, it's interesting that Paul draws on his Greek education here to quote from Greek poets to make a point. And uh, he does that frequently, by the way, even on the Mars Hill episode. If you really study that, you discover he quotes several times from Greek poets because that was a common understanding from his audience. But here, evil communications corrupt good manners. This is the second time Paul warns the Corinthians not to be deceived by their own society. And boy, you talk about our society. Are we deceived by our society? Boy, almost everything we're taught in our entertainments and in our schools is wrong. Undermines what God has established. Paul realizes the ease with which people accept perverted principles and lifestyles is normative. Think about that a minute. People accept perverted principles and lifestyles as if that's the normal thing to do. That doesn't make them right. They're still opposed to what God has inst instituted. And by the way, the word speech or com uh, company is homily, which you get homily, a practical application. That's where that word comes from. Our speech reveals our inner self. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame, Paul says. Awake to righteousness. Be alert to the spiritual dangers that surround you, is what he's saying. Eknep. Basata. Come back to your senses, he's saying. Does that fit us? Does that instruction get to us? Awake to righteousness and not. Stop sinning. That's present tense in the imperative mood. That's a command. It's not a suggestion, it's a comparative, it's a command. Some will say, How are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? That's a question, right? See, the Greek philosophers taught the immortality of the soul, but denied the immortality of the body. At the end of his Aeropagus address, the Mars Hill address, uh, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens scorned Paul over this very point. So we've taken a look at the definition of the gospel, the death and resurrection, and Christ's kingdom briefly in the first 35 verses of chapter 15. But we have, next time, we're going to explore the physics immort immortality, the resurrection of the body itself, and we'll explore a little bit the harpazo, this gathering up, commonly called the rapture from the, the Latin version of the Bible. And these first three were in section 14 that we've just concluded. In our next session, we'll take the next three to finish this chapter. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.